Good morning. Wow. Um, you ever have moments in your life where you just think, we just need to pause here and just soak in this right now? Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. I suspect this morning if we're all very honest in this room and all very honest for those of you watching online, we would say there are times we don't see it. We would say there are times we don't feel it. We would say that there are times that we're crying out in the night and saying, God, we need your light. We need your hope. We need your power. And we need to see you working. <clears throat> let's, let's pray. God, I believe you want to do something very powerful today. And I pray that you would remove any distraction that's in our heart and mind in this moment. Because God, I believe you want to use this, this message, your word, to get through all the muck and the mire and the mess of our lives so that we can hear none other than you speak. God, get me out of the way. Hide me behind the cross today that people would get a glimpse of you. God, that they would, they would get a glimpse, an encounter, an experience with the living God. And I pray it in the name of the living God, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Today I'm going to dive right into the Word. This is, this is, um, this has indeed been a tough couple of weeks in our family. We have um, walked alongside of a lot of families that are walking through the valley of the shadow of death and in, um, and, and especially whenever it's out of order, when it's a younger person, it's, it's, it's even harder um, as we process that in our community. In, in our church, in our community, in our larger area, and frankly, in our world. Uh, I was praying a lot yesterday for uh, people all across uh, the southeast and really even beyond the southeast who dealt with storms for protection and guidance and thinking in particular about the three families in Pickens County and the, the family members of those individuals as well. And so we come together this morning and I, I don't know about you, but I need, need. There's sometimes where I feel like I show up to worship and it's like, it'd be good for Jesus to move. It'd be great for Jesus to show up. But today it's not, it's just like it'd be a nice thing. It's God, I, I need you. I need you to. So we're going we're gonna to dive into Acts chapter 7. Last week we were in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. The disciples have been a part of seeing the church explode and grow. In by the time we get to the 6th chapter of Acts, uh, the church is, is being added. Thousands are being added to their number daily. They've got growing pains. They're trying to figure out how to do this. And the disciples say, choose from among you seven uh, persons that are filled with the Holy Spirit, that are full of wisdom. I'm sorry, it's just all over me this morning. <laughs> And are of a good reputation. Are credible witnesses for me. And, and so they do. They raise up seven persons. And, and the first, the very first one in that list is a young man named Stephen. And Stephen is one of those seven that are uh, Nicanor and Procurus. And, and this other group of, of young leaders, Gentiles from the area of the Sea of Galilee and there in Jerusalem, they're raised up to, to be ones who would tend to tables. They would wait on the widows. They would care for people so that the disciples can devote themselves, earnestly focus themselves on prayer and the ministry of the word. 
And as we get to the very next chapter, uh, (laughs) Stephen evidently has lost his lane because he doesn't just wait on tables. He ends up telling the story of God. 7, 1, all the way up to 54. Verse 54 is him basically telling the history of the people of God and how there's been those that followed Christ and there's been a stiff-necked group that rebelled against Christ. And they've had it. By the time we open up with verse 54, they are angry and they're ready to kill him. And I'm going to invite you to stand as we read verses 54 through 60 in Acts chapter 7. The tension is in the room as this begins. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. Or if you're reading the NIV, they gnashed their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened. And the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they crowd out with a loud voice and and stop their ears and rush together at him. And then they cast him down out of the city and stone him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus Receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. For this is the word of God for the people of God. God. You may be seated. The statement I want you to live with in this message, in this day, in this week, in this season of your life is to stand for the one who stands for you. To stand for the one who stands for you. And as you do so, I want you to consider your first blank today, and that is consider who it is that stands against you. In verse 54, it says this. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. I want you to be absolutely certain that there is an enemy. There are those who would lie to you and tell you, don't worry about it. There's no Satan. There's no hell. There's no adversary. There's no problem. It's just wrong. (laughs) From the beginning of creation, there has been an adversary. There has been an enemy. There has been one uh, against whom we have railed. And as a matter of fact, if you think about it, most every movie or book you have ever seen or read, and most every life that you have ever known has an enemy. It's the stuff that movies are made about and books are written about. It's the stuff that we see very clearly in our lives. Every, every great superhero movie also has a villain. And to be honest, sometimes the villain is us. We ourselves can be the ones who kind of rail against God's purposes. The villains in the stoning of Stephen, however, are the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, who became the religious mob. And as a matter of fact, I want you to consider that they gnashed their teeth or they ground their teeth. Everywhere in Scripture that you find that phrase, gnashing their teeth, every single place, it is having to do with those that are outside the will of God. And just consider it for a moment. I don't have time to live here long. But uh, the wicked plan against the righteous. uh, Psalms and Lamentations talks about it. Where they're gnashing their teeth. And Jesus himself told stories over and over about gnashing of teeth. Depending on which version of scripture you read. Either grinding teeth or gnashing of teeth. Uh, The faith of the centurion and the healing of his servant. For those that don't have that faith, there would be gnashing of teeth. The parable of the sower of the weeds, there would be gnashing of teeth. For those who didn't come to the wedding feast, they were invited, but then they didn't come. They came up with excuses and reasons they couldn't be there. And so Jesus invites everyone else in the parable. And, and the ones who first were invited who don't come later, they, they are still outside where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. The wicked servant who... Who deceives has gnashing of teeth. And, and most of all, the, the, worthless, 
the worthless servant in the parable of the talents who buried it, remember? And what he had was taken from him and given to the one who's, ones who had doubled it. And it says he was cast outside where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Gnashing of teeth is a sign and a symbol that they are against the things in, of God. It's very important that we realize that God's ways are not our ways. Now listen, listen, let me be really clear. We all pray to be David fighting against the enemy, Goliath. To be Gideon fighting against the overwhelming odds of the Midianites. To be in a lion's den with Daniel and to overcome all the lions or to be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to overcome the fiery furnace to be Esther who stands before the one who would seek to take out her people's lives. We all long to be the victorious, the ones who come out on top, the hero of the story. But there's a moment where every one of us must say like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, We're praying for this, and we know that our God can, but even if he does not, we want you to know, we won't bow. We won't bow to your gods when it's time to stand for ours. And I don't know where all God's calling you to stand this morning, but let me be clear. It's important to know why we stand. We stand, your second blank today, we stand... For the one who stands for us. This is, this is the, the piece that grabbed me this week that has not let me go all week as I've wrestled with this scripture. Acts 7, 55 and 56 says this. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing, again, standing at the right hand of God. I want you to remember why Stephen was chosen. He, he, along with the other six, the seven total of those leaders were chosen because they were persons filled with the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom and of good reputation. He is already known to be full of the Spirit. And here, he's even more filled with the Holy Spirit. As it says, he, he, he stood, he gazed into heaven, and he, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Stephen was given special strength for a special time. He he was given special strength for a special time. Now, hear this. We do not need all the strength available to us all the time. But we do need special strength that is available to us for such a time as this. When you walk through the valley of the shadow... When you are up against your adversaries, when the stones are hurled at your head, when life feels like it's rushing at you quickly, we get special strength as he gazed into heaven and saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father. The piece of this, though, that has really locked into me is that Jesus is standing. Twice, two verses in a row, it tells us that Jesus is standing at the right hand of God the Father. Now, I've gone back and read every single verse where it talks about Jesus at the right hand of the Father. All the way back into Psalms and all the Gospels. And and I've gone into uh, Romans and Ephesians and Colossians and tons of verses in Hebrews and 1 Peter. Every one of them, when it talks about Jesus, when it talks about Jesus at the right hand of the Father, you know what his posture is? He's seated. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father. This is the only place in all the Bible where it says, and I looked into heaven and I saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. And it's captivated my attention all week long. So this has been the question I've spent dozens and dozens of hours on this week. Why is Jesus standing? Why only here in Scripture is Jesus not seated at the right hand of the Father, but standing at the right hand of the Father? I've read every theologian I can get my hands on, dozens of them. Every single one of them. And, and, and I've heard all kind of different reasons why they believe Jesus was standing. I've read that uh, it's believed that Jesus was standing because he's preparing to welcome Stephen home. It, some theologians believe that he's standing, Jesus is standing, to intercede on behalf of Stephen, Stephen to the Father. 
One of my favorite biblical commentators, F.F. F. Bruce, has put it this way. He said, Stephen has been confessing Christ before men, and now he sees Christ confessing him before his father. Some, some theologians believe that Jesus is standing to cheer on Stephen's witness for Christ. As if almost in a, a stadium that there was a standing ovation, applause. That Jesus is standing for that reason. But here's what I've come to. In, in my own heart of hearts, it, it may very well be, it, and that makes sense too. Because if you think about the root word, the Greek word here for martyr and for witness, they come from the same Greek word, martis. Martyr, maturus. Uh, that we'd be a martyr for Christ, that we'd be a witness for Christ. And of course, Stephen's being a powerful witness. But watch this. I believe the reason that Jesus is standing is all of that. But it's also, when you go through your valley of the shadow, when you go through your, your pinch point, when we, you go through the refining fire, when you're walking in your most difficult place, I believe that Jesus stands and leans to be even closer than breath. I believe he stands, not just sits back, relaxed, like it's all going to be fine. But stands and leans into us. There are those that believe that Jesus turns his face when darkness and difficulty occurs. Because he can't be engaged and still see all that. No, I believe he's standing at attention. And leaning into your situation to say, you won't hurt alone because I'm here with you. Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, looks to heaven, casts his gaze upon Jesus, standing at the right hand of God the Father. It's this, it's this revelation over these last few weeks that's carried me as I've walked with Peyton Houston's family. It's this revelation that's carried me as I've walked with the Keith family and the bearing of their 30-year-old nephew this last week. It's this revelation that's carried me as I've walked with a pastor here in the North Alabama Conference whose 19-year-old son passed last week. It's this revelation yesterday as I stood in a home with a man who's watching his wife who is not long for this world. It's these places that I believe that Jesus stands and leans into us to say, you're not alone. I've got a hold of you. You don't need to worry or fear. The promises of God are true. They are absolutely bedrock true. And this is what brings me to the last. Is who are you standing for? Know, know who's standing against you. That's important that there's a villain, there's an enemy, there's an adversary. And, and know this, Jesus is standing at the right hand of God the Father with you, for you, on your behalf. You may stand for him, but he's standing with you in that. But watch this last blank. Know who you are standing for. Acts 7, 57 through 60. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. They stopped listening. You've, you've been there, right? Where you're in an argument and they go, blah, 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 blah. They stopped their ears and they rushed at him. And then they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. First time in scripture Saul shows up right here. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Let me be clear. There comes a point in every life where people will turn a deaf ear to our words. We are welcome to continue speaking. We can keep speaking, but our actions will speak in ways that our words never can. Stephen's first speech was to those around him about who Jesus is. I looked into heaven and I see Jesus at the right hand of the Father. But these last two speeches were to Jesus about them. He, he changes his focus from, I'm going to talk to you about Jesus to saying, no, I'm going to talk to Jesus about you. I, I'm not going to focus here because you're no longer listening to me. You've closed your ears. You, you've cut yourself off. You've become tone deaf to my voice. 
God has made promises to his church. He's promised 365 times in the scriptures, fear not for I'm with you. One for every day of the year. But you know why? Because we forget many days, too many days. Fear not for I'm with you. I will be with you. You will never be alone when you face those adversaries. You will never be alone as the stones get hurled your direction. But God has also made a promise about his word. Remember, he established his church. He is the word. He established the word. And he gave us the word to carry it to the end of creation. In 1 Peter 1.25, he simply says this. My word will never pass away. Different witnesses of my word, may we will pass away. We, we may struggle at different times in our life, and it may be hard to communicate that word, but God's word will still remain. When everything else falls away, his word will go forth. Stephen's words of testimony were essential to the spreading of the gospel beyond Jerusalem. If most theologians believe it was in this moment, here in Acts 7, when, when, when Stephen is the first martyr for the faith after Jesus... When, when Stephen is willing to stand up and say, here am I, I can stand nowhere else. When he's willing to say, I know you don't want to hear what I've got to say, but I don't have a choice. I've got to say it because of the one who compels me to do so. When, when he recognizes that as he looks into heaven that he's standing for Christ, but Christ is standing with him. He, he knows who he's standing for. He's standing for Christ, but he's also standing because there's a whole world of people watching and listening. After the stoning of Stephen, the witnesses in Jerusalem were launched into Judea and Samaria and ultimately to the outermost parts, to the ends of the earth, as was promised in Acts 1.8. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and outermost. It's, it's right here where this moves from Jerusalem. Because listen, we all have a tendency to just want to take care of us and ours, and me, mine, and my own. It's this moment where the, the, the faithful, the followers of Christ begin to become pers persecuted at a whole new level. And they leave Jerusalem and they go to the surrounding areas. And they go to the untouchables, the half-breeds of Samaria. And ultimately, they will go all the way to the ends of the earth. S Stephen's martyrdom, his, his being martyred for the faith, emboldened the spread of the gospel. It's almost like... These beautiful zinnia heads on our flowers that we've got. And if you think in the fall when we pluck all those heads off, they were trying to kill them, quite the contrary. So many of you have in your gardens at your homes seeds that came out of our garden from those zinnia flowers. And this year again, I've got a bumper crop of them sitting in my garage waiting over, over fall, over winter to be planted in the spring because it's, it's in that dying that one gives birth to many. It's in dying, this one zinnia plant that, that produced all these heads of zinnia flowers. And that one, each one of those heads has tons and tons of seeds in them. And I will literally, in the, in the spring when I plant those, I will till the soil and I will kind of scratch it up a little bit. And the way I will plant is so funny. I will just simply go out there and I will pick big handfuls of those heads and I'll just do this all over the place and those seeds will spread everywhere Stephen's Martin Stephen's life it was like this as he was being stoned it was almost like he was being churned up and and, and broken up so that the seeds of faith could be planted everywhere they thought in this moment the Sanhedrin thought that they could they could break this up and stomp this out but instead what they actually did is they they catalyzed the going forth of the gospel. Stephen fell asleep and Saul looked on in wholehearted approval. Paul is who he would later become. Saul, who on the Damascus road would have an encounter and Jesus would say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul would be raised up and used to be one of the greatest purveyors of the faith in all of the New Testament after Christ. He, the first half of Acts is basically Peter with the, the Jewish church. The second half of Acts is basically Paul with the Gentile church. The gospel going forth around the world. 
It's, it's this moment, though, that Saul will go back and pull from. Paul, ultimately, will go back and never forget this. In Acts, near the end of Acts, in Acts 22, verses 20 and 21, he'll say this. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And then one of those that saw who became Paul, later mentored, was Timothy. And in 1 Timothy 1.13, Paul said these words. Though formerly I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and insolent, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. You see, standing for Christ, friends, involves far more than speaking. I mean, it does involve speaking. Let's be clear. It, it involves, Stephen gives a public witness to his faith. He tells the story of God's people and, and how God has been faithful throughout every generation with, with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David and Esther. And he goes all the way through the lineage. And as he goes alongside of each one of them, he also talks about the stiff-necked religious leaders who rebelled against God's will and God's way. But... Standing for Christ may involve speaking, but suffering for Christ makes our speaking more credible. What does it cost you to stand for Christ? What is it costing you to stand for Christ? January 25th, you heard in the announcement reel, we'll have a gathering here at Clear Branch of traditionally Orthodox Wesleyan um, followers of Jesus. We'll have people here from all over the southeastern United States, literally from every annual conference in the southeast jurisdiction. We'll have an opportunity to hear inspiring message, inspiring. Uh, but friends, let me just promise you this. It costs something to host that event. And I don't mean it costs money to make the event happen. I mean it costs um, some persecution that will come for doing that event. It'll, it'll, cost, it'll cost something to stand up and say, here I stand, I can stand nowhere else. It, it will cost you something to follow Christ. It will cost you something. It, it may cost you people's snide remarks. It may cost you unlikes on social media. It may cost you people calling you a radical or one of those people. On one occasion, following unspeakable suffering in a, in a filthy prison, a missionary, Adonarim Judson, appeared before the king of Burma and asked permission to go to a certain city to preach. And I want you to hear the response that he received. I am willing for a dozen preachers to go, but not you. Not you was the king's answer. Not with those hands, not with those beaten, bruised, shriveled up hands. My people are not such fools as to take notice of your preaching. But they will take notice of your scarred hands. Wise words are one thing, but scarred hands reveal the testimony of one who believes what they preach. Have your hands been scarred? Has it cost you something to follow Jesus? Has it cost you something to stand up and give a, give a witness, give an account for, for I'm a follower of Jesus. And that may be popular and it may be not. Don't, I mean, don't test the wind direction and determine are people going to be good with this or not. No, make your stand for Christ. In every circumstance. Not waiting to see how the room goes, but determining in your own heart. We began the, the new year this last Sunday by starting on a year through the New Testament together. Incredible. 448 of us are walking together through the New Testament. I am beyond excited. The most we've ever had engage with us in reading through the, the, the scriptures together this year. And if, you, and if you haven't signed up yet, it's not too late. You can still get in on this. Uh, I want to encourage you to go to Facebook today and click in that group to, to join. And you'll be given the scripture, the observation, the application, the prayer each day. Incredible. But my favorite post of this week, I, I got the privilege of hosting and commenting this week as the lead. And Stephanie Phillips is doing a great job already this morning, kicking us off for this week. 
But my favorite post of this last week came from a 20-something year old young lady who is a teacher and a basketball coach. And her post was this. She said, I was, we we're in Matthew 5, verse 14, talking about you are the light of the world. And she made a great illustration. And she said, I'm mindful that with a glow stick, the only way you see the light is when it gets broken. And if you want to see all the light and see it brilliantly, you break it many times. I'm convinced that as Stephen was being stoned, he was being broken over and over and over. And the light of Christ just emanated, illuminated out of him in such a profound way that it gave light to everyone around, including Saul, who became Paul, who came from being a reluctant observer of Christ's ways to being a powerful purveyor of Christ's truth. How about you this morning? Stephen prayed in, in Acts 7, 59 and 60. He prayed to commit his spirit to Jesus while he stood. And then he fell to his knees to pray forgiveness for those who were stoning him. He, he prayed Just like the prayers of Jesus on the cross, as Jesus said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. He prayed and then he died. Stephen commits his spirit into the hands of Jesus. And then he prays like Jesus. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Stephen says, Jesus, forgive them. Don't hold this against them. When we muster the strength the, the, the incredible strength to ask God to receive our spirit and ask God to forgive our enemies, it releases the light of Christ and it breaks forth from the glow stick of our lives. It breaks down walls that have divided us. It, it reconciles family members that have long held grudges. It allows the light of Christ to come out of the brokenness in our lives. I'm convinced that Stephen's witness here in Acts 7 and his willingness to to even follow Jesus to the point of death. Let's be clear, when it says he fell asleep, he died. He didn't didn't take out the giant Goliath and win. He didn't lift up the head and say, look at this. He he didn't overcome the lions or the fiery furnace. He, He didn't take out all the Midianites. God's ways are not our ways. It doesn't mean we always in this life scream victorious. Because our victory is not just meant for this world. I talk with people all the time that they're good with following Jesus so long as Jesus is kind of the grand puppeteer and makes everything happen the way they want him to. Like he'll, he'll make me healthy and wealthy and wise and my children and family members and friends as well. That's not the way it always goes. I'm convinced that Stephen's willingness to be a witness for Christ was the catalytic event that carried the gospel out of Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and the outermost parts of the world. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that this was accomplished through all the disciples and especially through eavesdropping Saul, who at the moment was an adversary, but later became an advocate. He went from cynical Saul to persevering Paul. And part of it's because he saw the witness of Stephen. How about you? Are you ready to stand for the one who stands for you? If so, I'm going to invite you to stand as we pray. Let us pray. Lord, forgive us for the times we have remained seated when it was time to stand. Forgive us for the times we have remained silent because of those who gnash their teeth at us. Help us, O oh God, to turn our gaze toward heaven instead of being captivated by the adversaries of earth. Allow us to see you as we do, standing on our behalf. And allow us to live lives that are worthy of you standing. Help us to feel you rushing into us when we feel the world rushing at us. 
Help us to tell others about you, but also to bring others to you in prayer. And empower us to be people whose witness with words is second only to our witness with action. But help us to be willing and ready to give witness to why we do what we do for you. Help us always to remember that there are those who are standing back and watching to see if we really will stand. If we really will stay standing. If we really will take up our cross, count the cost and follow you. Help us to be willing to suffer for what we believe. Empower us to do so in ways that look like you, Jesus. Not just saying, take out the enemy, but saying, forgive them for they know not what they do. Like Stephen, who was like Jesus, help us to commit our lives and our spirit to you. Like Stephen, who was like Jesus, empower us to forgive our enemies and to free them too to follow you. Help us to see our brokenness as a way to let you shine all the brighter through our lives. And I pray that you would shine, God. I pray that you'd be a way maker where there seems to be no way. I pray that we would proclaim even when I can't see it you're moving even when I can't feel it you're moving because you never stop you've never stopped since the beginning of creation God you've been pursuing us in the garden of Eden in the garden of Gethsemane and in the garden of our lives God you are still pursuing us God, I pray that we would stand for the one who stands for us. And that you would give us the power and the courage and the strength to follow you, the way maker. And all God's people said,